Let me introduce our speaker. The title is The Son of God and the Antichrist. Bill Snevlin has seen over 100 UFOs and studied them for over 40 years. He's a member of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, NICAP. Interviewed, over 100 people have been abducted, including Christians, by the way. Bill will show pictures of physical evidence of the sons of God. He will explain their connections to black magic, fallen angels, DNA, and how it relates to the mark of the beast, and a counterfeit gospel. Bill says the sons of God will reveal themselves and be a part of deceiving millions of people, including Christians, into denying Jesus. Will you help me welcome Bill Sneblin. God bless and welcome. No, thank you. It's <clears throat> great to be here. Just one slight correction. I was a member of NICAP. I am no more involved in that. That was when I was a young, you know, young person. But anyhow, I'm not even sure the organization is still out there. Um, as we've already been told, the title of the talk is The Sons of God, in Hebrew, the B'nai Elohim, and the Antichrist. And we want to start out by just a little bit of a scripture verse. The place that we're, we're dealing with tonight is, of course, a lot from Genesis chapter 6. And the core verse there is verse 2, where it says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So the question becomes, what are these sons of God, these B'nai Elohim, what does this passage mean? Because it's very controversial. We're going to get into that in a moment. But first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about my own, my own um, background and everything with this. Uh, as Stan said, I've been an avid student of this stuff for over 40 years. And uh, I've watched it grow from a very much of a fringy kind of thing where only a handful of isolated kooks like me were involved in it to where it's become is still somewhat marginalized. That's why I think there's resistance to receiving it in the church as a subject. But now there are many millions of people that are really involved in this. And it's, it's grown considerably. And <clears throat> over the years as I've talked about this, because I have about four or five tapes dealing with the UFO phenomenon, videos or audios, whatever. And oftentimes, People will ask me, well, were you abducted? Was I abducted by aliens? Because people look at my background and they say, what, you know, how could anybody do all this weird stuff unless something bizarre, something totally stunningly bizarre like being, you know, abducted by aliens and taken to a spaceship and having, you know, little pointy things stuck up your nose and stuff like that, you know. How, how else could you explain me being this weird kind of person? Especially because I had a otherwise very normal, nice upbringing, you know, with good parents and all of that. Well, before I answer that question, I want to explain the close encounter grid. Um, back, I think it was in the 70s, the guy who used to run Project Blue Book, that was the Air Force's um, supposed investigative committee, to look at UFO reports that came into them. Because their job, their mandate from the government, the Air Force, is to protect our skies. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep bad guys out of our skies. And so anyhow, this professor, J. Allen Hynek, he came up with a kind of a formula to sort of categorize where these very, because they were getting thousands of UFO reports a year. And so he categorized them as close encounters of four kinds. Close encounter, or the first kind, is like a distant sighting. Like if I'm sitting there in my car, you know, waiting at an intersection, and I look up and I see, a, you know, this unexplained object. Now remember, that's all a UFO is. It's an unexplained object, an unidentified object that happens to be flying. It does not have to be from the planet Venus. You know, it does not have to be a spaceship. It might be. It could be any number of things. Until I know what it is, it is a UFO. Maybe later on I find out, oh, that was a weather balloon that was going over. Or maybe it was marsh gas. You never know. So anyway, so that's the close encounter of the first kind. 
Close encounter of the second kind is when a UFO is sighted in the air and then subsequently somebody finds evidence on the ground. By that we mean things like, you know, impressions in grass, burn marks, uh, skid marks, uh, or even maybe radiation or anomalous levels of um, bioelectric energy, things like that, or even something like a crop circle. Okay. Close encounter of the third kind. Of course, that's the thing that they made the movie about and everything. But that's when you have an actual encounter with a UFO op occupant. Maybe, you know, you're standing there and this UFO comes down out of the sky and this guy comes out and says, Klatu Barada Nikto, and gets back in his ship and up he goes again. Uh, so that's a close encounter of the third kind. Then after a few years, they decided they needed a fourth one, and that's close encounter of a fourth kind, which is a very close encounter because you're usually kidnapped, taken aboard a spacecraft, supposedly, and have medical experiments done to you, and you don't get much closer than that, you know. So I want to just, you know, emphasize that. It also depends on the context. You know, something that might be considered a UFO in one generation might be considered something entirely different in another. Let me illustrate. If you know the origins of Mormonism and what you see up there is a stained glass representation of supposedly how the Mormon church got started. Joseph Smith was, you know, a young man in the days of what they called the Great Revival, where all of these preachers were going over the colonies and and the early states of the Union preaching and people were getting saved. There were revival meetings all over the place. So much so it was called the Burned Over District because it was like the revival fibers had gone through so many times it was like hardly anybody was left that hadn't been touched by them. And, you know, he was being propositioned by Methodists and propositioned by Presbyterians and he wanted to know what church to join. And he never read the Bible. He came from this shiftless, good-for-nothing family where basically his parents were con artists and occultists. And he claims, according to the story, he never read the Bible in his life. And he was maybe 16 years old. And they had this enormous family Bible. And he opened it up and happened to fall open to James 1, where, of course, it says, If any man needeth wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And so he took that, and he went out into the woods to pray to what has come to be known as the Sacred Grove near Palmyra, New York. I don't know if any of you have been there or not, but it's supposed to be a very pretty little spot. And anyhow, he knelt down and prayed. And this is, this is the part that's important. As he's praying, he says, all of a sudden, a beam of light came down from heaven. And it just was like this cylinder of light that encircled him. And... He didn't know what was going on, and he continued to pray and ask, what church should I join? And then all of a sudden, he said he was enveloped with this darkness that was suffocating, that he felt he, could, he couldn't even live in it. It was like taking the air out of his very lungs. And he cried out for help, and at that moment, the darkness dissipated, and he saw this pillar of light again, except in the middle of it were two glorious personages dressed entirely in white that glowed in the dark. And they looked exactly alike. And one gestured to the other and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. If you want to find out about that, get my Mormon tape. They have a thing called What's Wrong with Mormonism here, a video. But the point is, that's how a whole now 10 million member religion started. But if you look at that, and you look at it through the eyes of our modern, scientific, technologically oriented worldview, you could just easily say, oh, there was a UFO up there, and they beamed somebody down or two somebody's down, just like, you know, the Star Trek Enterprise doohickey. And zip, there they are, and they're dressed in white, and they glow, you know, just like space brothers do. And, you know, there was even this kind of mysterious darkness and everything. It could just as easily be a UFO encounter as an encounter with a divine being. I personally don't think it was either one. Then we have the Fatima apparition. This is the thing that happened in 1917 where supposedly these three children in Portugal had seen this lady. And believe it or not, she came down out of the sky in a bubble of light, just like, you know, Glinda, the good witch and the Wizard of Oz. And she was dressed entirely in white, 
except she had a blue sash on and